Today we're going to walk through the AAMC sample test one, BB section, passage number one. Let's jump right into it. I'm going to read through this passage. I'm going to go ahead and make a flow chart. If you don't know what I'm doing is when I'm mapping out these passages, make sure to go back and, and watch our old strategy videos. There's one called Interpreting the MCAT um, or How to Interpret the MCAT, and it's talking about this method that I use called the flow chart method. Um, and so, again, of course, we're always looking for basic sciences, and we're also looking for relationships. So, just for the sake of brevity, I'm going to highlight the basic sciences, and I will write or draw out the actual relationships. Um, the flowchart on the BB section actually gives you a lot of extra points, just some freebies. And hopefully we'll, we'll jump into some of that here. Um, so it begins, it says, proper biomolecular trafficking, including protein packaging by the Golgi apparatus. Okay, that's a basic science. Like, that's what the Golgi apparatus does, is it packs up proteins that are destined for secretion, um, essentially. And it kind of labels them as such. It's like the post office. Um, is essential to the compartmentalized eukaryotic cell. Therapeutic agents that disrupt the function of the Golgi apparatus reduce cell viability and can serve as effective treatments for carcinoma. So um, here we have that we can, if we have these therapeutics, that actually decrease the function of the Golgi. So decrease Golgi, I'm just gonna say GA for Golgi apparatus. Um, if we decrease the function of the Golgi, that can lead to decreased cancer, which makes sense. Like we kill a vital cell function, then we're gonna end up killing the cell. Goes on to say ADP ribosylation factor or ARF1 plays an essential role in vesicle formation, is responsible for the recruitment of cytosolic protein coat complexes and subsequent retrograde transport from the Golgi. Okay, that should sound like word soup to you. You're not supposed to know what ARF1 is. You're not supposed to know what COPs are. I mean, you know, um, but not in this scenario. Um, you're not supposed to know. You're, I don't even remember learning about retrograde transport. Um, but because of the basic sciences within these terms, we can kind of figure out what they do. But we can definitely figure out the relationships. And so that's what I'm going to mainly focus on here is their relationships. So it says that RF1 helps with vesicle formation. So RF1 forms vesicles and is responsible for the recruitment of um, COPs. So RF1 also recruits COPs, which it says subsequently leads to retrograde transport. So it leads to um, this transport from the Golgi apparatus, this is retrograde. So that means we're kind of reversing course. Okay, so the question you ask yourself is, okay, well, if it's retrograde transport, then where do proteins come from before they're at the Golgi? And the answer to that would be the endoplasmic reticulum. So the general order would be the ER goes to the Golgi, which goes to secretion. But if we're going in a retrograde fashion, then we're going backwards here. Okay? That's all that really means. It's nothing that you had to super have memorized, um, but you can kind of figure that out. Okay, so that's a good little relationship there right off the bat. Um, it says RF1 is activated by GEFs. Um, okay, so we got another relationship here. So RF1 is activated. So, increased function by GEFs, which replace guanosine diphosphate, or GDP, with GTP. So, GEFs lead to increased GTP, or increased phosphorylation, I'd say. Um, kind of makes me think, like, right off the bat, like, I guess you're a kinase, maybe, if you're increasing phosphorylation. Um, but we'll we'll see. I'll have to think that through a little bit more. It says, upon GTP exchange, RF1 undergoes a conformational change that releases the myristolated N-terminus of the polypeptide chain from a structural group in the protein 
and initializes localization to the phospholipid layers. All I really care about that is that when we have this GTP shift right here, when we have this GTP exchange, then we are localizing um, these proteins to the phospholipid bilayer. So I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say GTP shift, or I'll say delta. So a change in DT GTP is going to lead to increased um, phospholipid, or I'll say PL for phospholipid localization. Now notice that these are not like super extensive notes. This isn't something that I could come back to, uh, you know, in three days and know what I was getting at. But because I have just read the passage five seconds earlier, I will remember it for the portion of getting the questions right. And that's my whole goal in the MCAT. I don't care what anybody says. You can't convince me that there's a goal um, within the MCAT other than getting questions right. That's all I care about. And this is a really efficient way to do it within the allotted time. Once associated with the bilayer, RF1, uh, and this is increased phospholipid localization of RF1. You could put that if you want to make sure that you know what you're getting at. Um, it says, once associated with the bilayer, RF1 further facilitates vesicle formation by the recruitment of um, heterotetrameric dimers of dimers. So that's a basic science. Um, Codomer protein complex COP1 subunits are beta, delta, gamma, and I'm really not sure what this Greek figure is. Maybe epsilon. I don't know. Um, so we recruit those. You can write that if you want. R4 and GT pace activating protein or the gap catalyzes the conversion of RF1 bound GTP to GDP and inorganic phosphate, thereby converting the protein to the inactive form. Okay, that's pretty that's pretty big right there. It says this gap protein, which is the RF1 GTPase, converts RF1 bound to GTP. So I'm gonna say GTP to GDP. So we, we can identify what type of protein that is and inorganic phosphate, thereby converting the protein to the inactive form. So that leads to inactive RF1. So now I know that active RF1 is phosphorylated or attached to GTP. Inactive is attached to GDP. Uh, gap activity is increased by RF1 binding to this weird complex. That This is always important. Whenever they tell me that something is increased or upregulated, that's a super important um, relationship. And so I'm going to go ahead and write down as I, or increased gap activity is increased by, or related to an increase in the beta delta. Cop one. I know I didn't write the whole thing, but I'll know what I'm getting at. And then it goes on to say, Brefeldin A or BFA is a lactone component isolated from fungi has been shown to inhibit RF1 driven vesicle formation. Okay. Resulting in reversible disruption of the Golgi apparatus. Okay. So we could say that um, BFA kind of decreases RF1 activity. Uh, if you would like to. So we can say BFA leads to decrease RF1. Notice what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to get a list of like simple relationships so that I, instead of having, you know, if I get asked a question that's essentially what does BFA do and how is it working, I don't have to go through and like reread all this stuff. I can just go back and look at, at my notes and it says BFA leads to a decrease in RF1 and then I can go back and be like, well, how does RF1 work again? And I go up here and I say, oh yeah, RF1 works by um, being attached to a GTP. So this paragraph again says BFA shown to inhibit RF1 activity resulting in reversible disruption of the Golgi apparatus and tumor remission in vitro. So that's kind of pulling it full circle to when we were talking about the Golgi apparatus earlier. 
Because of its low bioavailability, BFA is not a suitable candidate for pharmaceutical deployment. However, it has led to the identification of AMF-26 as a promising drug. So they're saying it kind of works, but we just don't have a lot of it. Um, maybe that's a question they asked, but probably not. AMF-26 is predicted to bind to the protein-protein contact interface of ARF1, preventing GTP exchange by GEF, and disrupting ARF1 membrane localization in the critical step of COP1 recruitment and vesicle formation. Okay, that, those, that's a ton of relationships in there, but you don't have to write them down because you've already got all of those. This paragraph should have made sense to you if you, fo if you followed along with the relationships. In clinical settings, oral administration of AMF-26 has led to remission of breast cancer, xenografts, and mice models. So I am going to say um, AMF-26 leads to decreased cancer. Um, of course, that's a hard line that I would not be willing to draw um, anywhere else besides the MCAT, which kind of relies on generalities. But that's it for the passage. So you notice, first BB passage I'm breaking down with you, there's a ton of relationships, and that's going to be consistent. So now let me go and show you how those are applied to the questions. So looking at this first question, it says hydrolysis of the gamma phosphate of GTP bound to ARF1 results in what? So this is essentially just saying is if we have GTP and we hydrolyze it, meaning we use water to chop it off, we end up with GDP, right? What does that do to ARF1? Well, we found out earlier in our flowchart, right here, we see that gap. It's this large relationship, but all it's saying is that we have a shift from GTP, or I'm sorry, it's right here. We have a shift from GTP to GDP, and that inactivates ARF1. So that's really easy. That's a free question right there. The correct answer is inactivation. So the flowchart can really score you some easy points as it did there. The note, second one says the ARF1 activating molecule GTP is most closely related to which family of biomolecules? So what type of biomolecule is um, GTP? Okay, GTP um, is guanosine triphosphate. They even lay it out for us in the passage, which is going to be a nitrogenous base, like a DNA base attached to three phosphates. Um, and so... Looking at A, are nucleotides in GTP? Yeah, it's part of the guanosine. Um, so maybe A. B, is there an amino acid in that? No, nitrogenous bases nor phosphates are not um, examples of amino acids, lipids, or carbohydrates. But they are examples of nucleotides. This third one says GAP belongs to what class of enzymes? So first we need to figure out what GAP ends up doing. So we go back to our handy-dandy flowchart. Here we see that GAP takes a GTP and it cleaves it. It cleaves a phosphate off. Okay, so what type of molecule is going to cut a phosphate off? Okay, we see transferase is answer choice A. Transferase involves the adding um, the the sub or the molecule that you're cutting off um, onto an additional molecule. So we don't see that, though, because we have this free-floating phosphate. So once we cut off this phosphate off of GTP, we have a free-floating phosphate. So maybe not A. We look at B, which is phosphatase. The definition of a phosphatase is just something that's going to cleave off a phosphate. Um, so maybe to B. I like B. C says kinase. Kinase usually involves the addition of a... Um, it usually involves the addition of a phosphate group. And generally, you pull that from some type of organic molecule like a GTP or an ATP. So this one's tricky. However, you can rule out kinase because a kinase would cleave the GTP, but it would take this inorganic phosphate and it would actually add it onto some other random molecule. Okay, But we're not seeing that. We just see the inorganic phosphate kind of freely floating out there into the ether or just the amino you know, cytosol. Um, and so maybe not to see then. 
And then isomerase would, involves this idea of like moving around the molecule but maintaining the same chemical structure. And that's not what we see. So the correct answer here would be phosphatase. That's a pretty easy um, basic question if your flowchart is telling you exactly what's going on. Number four says proteins that are encapsulated in R4 and COP derived vesicles are bound for the what? Okay, this is actually something I kind of pointed out. Let's see what happens in the R4 and um, COP vesicles. So if we scroll up, we see that these R4 vesicles recruit COP. So the R4 and COP vesicles take proteins from the Golgi apparatus and transfer them to the endoplasmic reticulum. That is that retrograde transport that uh, we are talking about. And so the correct answer here is obviously going to end up being endoplasmic reticulum. We start at the Golgi, we go to the ER because that's retrograde. Um, a normal um, non-retrograde transport, just normal transport would be start at the ER, go to the Golgi, then you get secreted. But retrograde is kind of backwards. Retrograde. Um, so you kind of had to use a little bit of intuition of like um, prefixes there to figure out what that's talking about. But it's fairly easy to piece together. And the very last one says, based on the mode of action described for BFA in the passage, the drug would be most effective against what? Okay, so now we have to see what BFA is and what it's acting on. So let's go find it. It says that BFA decreases ARF1. Okay. So I am going to have to go back into the passage because that doesn't answer the question yet for me. So I'm going to go back up here to where we're talking about BFA. It says it's derived from fungi. Um... It inhibits R4-driven vesicle formation and disrupts the Golgi. Okay, so if we're disrupting the Golgi apparatus, which of these has a Golgi apparatus? There's only one of them. The correct answer here would be eukarya. Viruses don't have a Golgi apparatus. Bacteria don't have membrane-bound ve uh, vesicles, so they don't have a Golgi ap apparatus. And archaea don't have a Golgi apparatus either. So you can kind of see that BB, it hides behind these really dense and difficult to get through passages, these super sciencey passages. But if you can take the time, if you can get really good at this part of it, this flowchart part of it, BB is an easy 130 to 132 perfect score on the exam. As long as you know your high yield sciences and you can properly flowchart. So I hope I can kind of convince you of that. But if not, then there's plenty of passages left. Um, as always... Thanks for watching the video. Make sure you like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.